Fontenoy, 1745. The Battle of Fontenoy is notable on several accounts. For the French, it is the masterpiece of the Marshal de Saxe and a victory with wide strategic consequences. The British have long recalled the stout-heartedness of the infantry and look back with no less pride on the dash and sacrifice of their opponents in the Irish Brigade in the service of France. In the spring of 1745, the commanders of the Allied army in the Austrian Netherlands rejected the project of the British General Lingonier for a thrust into France and merely waited upon events. So it was that the initiative was left entirely to the French, whose commander was not a man likely to neglect such an opportunity. The Marshal de Saxe had already achieved a considerable reputation both as military thinker and rake of prodigious powers, and in April 1745 he directed a feint northeast towards Mons and then pounced with his powerful army upon the fortress of Tournai and sealed up the unsuspecting garrison. At Bruxelles the Allies were taken aback and the news that the Saxe was on the move and still more so when they later heard that the gateway to western Flanders was as good as within his grasp. They accordingly marched south and then west by circuitous and ill-directed marshes, largely under the impression of the feint on Mons, and thus gave the Saxe ample time to prepare a position where he would be all too delighted to receive them. Leaving a force to contain Tournai, the Saxe arrayed the rest of his army in a carefully chosen defensive line five miles to the southeast of the fortress. In outline, the French position was a sharp salient extending eastwards from the Scheldt at Antoin for just over a mile to the apex of the hamlet of Fontenoy and then turning at the right angles north to the wood of Barry and the village of Ramecroix. Both flanks were securely anchored, the one on a river and the other on a wood. But the Saxe improved his strong position still further by studying it with redoubts of his own devising. These were compact earthworks, furnished with artillery, which could direct a heavy fire against an enemy advancing from the front or around the flank, and yet leave the French troops wide gaps through which they could launch their own attacks. A decided improvement upon Villars' entrenchments at Malpaquet. Three such redoubts were thrown up on the French right, between Antoine and Fontenoy, and the further battery was cunningly ensconced on the far bank of the Scheldt. To the left of his line, however, the Saxe devoted his greatest attention, for here he expected the assault of the British, whom he accounted the most formidable troops of the Allied army. On his far left, he lined the wood of Barry with sharpshooters, and constructed two redoubts on the fringes of the wood. The southernmost of these earthworks became famous as the Redoubt de Aux. Two lines of infantry, supported by two further lines of cavalry, were disposed behind a sunken road leading northwards from Fontenoy across a low plateau in the direction of Ramecroix. The French troops would be out of sight of the enemy until the last moment, and to get this far the Allies would have had to cross the natural glasses formed by the gentle and open eastern slopes of the plateau. A reserve of fine troops, including the six regiments of the Irish Brigade, was placed behind the wood of Barry and Fontenoy itself was converted into a miniature fortress. The Allied plan of attack for 11th May was clear and simple, but based upon a faulty recognizance undertaken the day before. The Austrians and Dutch were to tackle the French right between Antoine and Fontenoy, while the British were to press home their assault against the apparently clear ground between Fontenoy and the Wood of Barry. The advance in the early hours of the 11th had already begun when Cumberland learned for the first time of the existence of the Redoubt de Aux. The strength of the flanks of the French left was only now appreciated and their clearing became a matter of the greatest importance. The Dutch assault against Fontenoy was however thrown back by a murderous fire as were the attacks of the Austrians and of the rest of the Dutch against the French right, no less fatally than muddles and delays of Brigadier in Goldsby prevented a detached command of British and Hanoverians from carrying the Redoubt de Aux. The continued resistance of these two strong points was a thorn in the side of the British for the remainder of the battle. 
Meanwhile, the British cavalry had completed its passage of the broken country around Vezon, and at about 6 a.m. it deployed in the plain beyond the full view of the French gunners, who began to rain down shot on the motionless squadrons. The cavalry endured its torture until Lingonier brought the British infantry through the intervals and arrayed the foot in two lines in front. At last, at 10.30, Cumberland took the head of the beautifully dressed lines and led them to the beat of drum against the plateau. Neither a destructive artillery fire nor the first volley of the French infantry were able to break or hasten the steady controlled pace of the British, and the depleted redcoats finally delivered one appalling blast of fire which reduced the French lines to a shambles. The two British lines pressed on into the French camp, gradually collapsing under the effect of the enemy fire into one monstrous column against which even the Maison de Roy and the Irish regiment of Dillon threw themselves to no purpose. A renewed Dutch assault on Fontenoy having failed, the British withdrew to the crest of the ridge to reform, and then came on again. The French gunners were in a frenzy, loading their pieces with stones and glass when their grape shot was exhausted, and now that the crisis of the day had come, the Saxa did not hesitate to commit his last reserves to the fight. The five remaining regiments of the Irish brigade charged yelling against the British right, while a number of line regiments and the French and Swiss guards closed in on the left. Early in the afternoon, Cumberland had to order his drummers to beat out their order to fall back. The British accomplished their retreat in admirable order, the rear guard facing about at measured intervals to drive away the pursuers. The Battle of Fontenoy had established the clear superiority of the French in force and high command, and September found the Allies in the north of Belgium concerned only with preserving their communications with Antwerp. Tournai, Newport, Ostend, Brooks and Ghent all had fallen to the Saxe, and with the outbreak of the Jacobite rebellion, the British were forced to look for a time to their own defences. <laughs>